Welcome to CG webinar and seminar number 270. And today we're again talking about science, but this time we're talking about science in terms of the agency of scientists, scientists as humans, uh, and, uh, and that positions science a bit differently from the way we've been talking about it from on high as it, as it were, and in relation to large data sets. And to take us into science as a human endeavor, we have Mags Blackie, Margaret Blackie from South Africa. Now, before I introduce our speaker, let me take you through the webinar protocols. Remember that the webinar is being recorded and will wind up on YouTube fairly soon. We usually post it on our website and that way into YouTube within about 48 hours of the session. The transcript of the chat is usually also posted on our website. Now, during the webinar, please keep yourself muted unless you've been asked to speak or you're asking your question in the Q&A section. I find that if we're picking up lots of Australian's background noises from different speakers, it can, uh, sorry, from different listeners, it can interrupt the, um, the, the webinar for everyone else. And there's no need to have your video on either, you know, during the presentation, but uh, it's a good idea to turn it on when you're asking your question later. Now to ask a question, develop your question in the chat. And if you want to make a statement rather than asking a question, you're most welcome to do so the same way. So type it out and I'll select the participants in the Q&A on the basis of what's coming into the chat. So it's a good idea to come in early. Um, if you come in in the last five or 10 minutes of the session, you can miss out um, and we won't hear your words of wisdom. Whereas if you put your comment into or your question into the chat towards the end of the speech or just after, then you're very likely to be selected if your comment is relevant to the topic of the webinar. When you're invited to ask your question, and I'll give you a warning in the chat usually if I can before that, um, please unmute yourself, switch on your video and then state your name and where you are from. So it's a pleasure to introduce Margaret Blackie who's a senior lecturer in the Department of Chemistry and Polymer Science at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. She also teaches theology at the same institution. She has research interests in medicinal chemistry and in, tertiary, in um, tertiary education. Uh, and um, in this session, I think she'll combine these various interests in, a, in an incisive way, in a way that takes us into the human aspect of science. So. Pleasure to hand over to you, Max, and the screen is now yours. Great, thank you very much, Simon. We can see that. That's great. good. Let me go back to my title slide. Um, great, well, thanks very much for joining everyone. I'm just gonna start my timer so I know where I'm going, where I am in terms of time here. Um, so thanks very much for joining me this afternoon. Uh, um, as you said, combining uh, my interest both in chemistry and in and in in tertiary education, and in fact, I, I've I've made the rather foolish step of undertaking a second PhD uh, this time in in higher education, and so this is something of a summary of, of the work that's gone into that, and this is very much a emerges out of uh, my own interest. So, by way of beginning. The challenge of uh, chemistry of learning chemistry has been known for well, <laughs> anyone who's done an undergraduate or has done high school chemistry will know that it's not an easy subject to master. And uh, one of the ways in which the, that's been expressed has been through the work of Alex Johnston, who is a very well known uh, chemistry education researcher. Um, and he came up with this this. Uh, explanation for the challenge of learning chemistry, which has been known as Johnston's Triangle, and has been existed, existed in the literature since the early 1980s. And the challenge is that we, we have to um, navigate these three worlds, the, the observable, the macroscopic world, what's happening in the flask, with uh, the, the molecular understanding, and then the symbolic representation of that. Um, and the, the crucial thing uh, here with this understanding is that chemistry is a significantly challenging, conceptually challenging 
uh, subject. And so uh, when we, most of uh, the efforts in chemistry education um, are towards developing uh, sort of, I guess, countering misconceptions, if I can put it that way. There is some interesting work in terms of how we deal with practical um, elements and those sorts of things. But what is notably uh, absent, not entirely absent, but is a very minor part of uh, the chemistry literature, sorry, going the wrong way, um, is the transition from, how do we get from the flask much of the focus of chemistry education is on that sort of that, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know why this is rushing through here, um, is focused very much on what's happening in the flask and how do we understand that. The problem with that is that we forget that there's a human person who is uh, doing, who's putting that, putting that together. So, uh, much of my work, as I'll say a little bit later on, in terms of looking at uh, the decolonization of science, has made me much more aware of the significance of the human person. Nonetheless, we've got to take a couple of steps before we can bring the human person fully into focus. So the first part of the process is thinking about how we learn chemistry and developing a, a method by which we can make uh, the learning of chemistry much more explicitly reflexive. And so uh, I'm just going to go very briefly through this. This is work that's published earlier this year. One of the first steps then is bringing into focus uh, not just the chemistry knowledge, but the student who is learning the chemistry. And one of the things that I've developed in that um, uh, to help the student uh, understand what is happening in chemistry uh, is this uh, development of a what I've called the epistemic assessment framework, but it's essentially a way of stratifying the kinds of knowledge that we need to engage with in order to master chemistry. It's focused on assessments because some of my prior work has been uh, interested in has been focused on looking at the value of assessments. But essentially all we're doing here is making, making sure that we are in fact um, assessing at the level of principle and new problem, because that's where the transferable knowledge comes. I think more significantly than, the, than that is uh, making the stratification visible to the student means that they can now, instead of simply mastering chemical concepts, they, what is now made visit, visible to them is a sense of what it takes to master uh, learning of a science. And that then is entirely transferable to, to other fields. So that's, that's sort of the, the background work that I've done so far on, on, on this. And the, sort of the, the first move, as I say, is just to bring the student at, who is learning chemistry into focus. But the, the bigger picture and, and what's more significant for, uh, for this work is then looking at, we've looked at the flask, we've looked at the student, but beginning to focus on this, what I'll call the community of chemists. And this picture, in fact, is uh, when I, I, I did a Google image search on the American Chemical Society leadership, and this was the image that showed up. So. Um, What's important there, the reason that this is important is, again, because of work I've, I've done in the past with my uh, colleague uh, from Stellenbosch, Hanley Ardendorf, uh, looking at, she and I have been fairly instrumental in the South African context, at looking at uh, the decolonization of science, uh, the decolonization with, particularly within a science context. And this this, of course, speaks very much to my own personal interest of where is the human person in chemistry education. When we first stumbled into the decolonization space in STEM, the, the, the immediate knee-jerk response was science is objective, therefore the decolonization conversation has no place here. And of course, what's happening here is a conflation between the idea that science, scientific knowledge is objective, 
and scientists are objective. And my my argument and and our argument in terms of some of the in terms of the the papers that we've developed is this this idea that if we can develop knower uh, what we call knower awareness um which is essentially taking into account the human person uh we can then begin to separate out that that conflation and the work that i've been doing over the last couple of years has been developing a an argument in science that that uh i can take back to scientists to say this is why it's important and and for that i turn um fairly unsurprisingly for, for you who know critical realism to the work of Bhaskar. and the essential part here this is sort of the, the classical um understanding in basic critical realism that there is a real world and the real world is the source of what Bascar calls mechanisms. So in chemical terms, if we think about the reaction between, um, say, bicarbonate of soda and vinegar, which you may, it does a lovely fizzing thing, you can try that this evening if you've never seen it. The real mechanism for that reaction has existed since, mm, since the time when those, when those uh, uh, molecules came into being. Um, the actual is the place, uh, it is the, the, the moment when I pour the uh, vinegar into the bicarbonate of soda. There is an, there's a time bound event that happens there. And then the empirical is the space of observation, what's happening there. And obviously it's science um, is limited, is, is the attempt of explaining what is happening in the real through observation of the empirical. The crucial, the, there are a couple of crucial points here that um, the, the Bascar's, um, I, Bascar's uh, aim was to uh, distinguish between ontology and epistemology. And the crucial thing, one important element here is that the observable is a subset of the real. We will never be able to, we are limited by our capacity to observe. And uh, that includes instrumentation. Nonetheless, we are limited by that. But the, the, the insight afforded by critical realism is that the scientist is an agent, not a passive observer. So for Bhaskar is very clear that in terms of what we are doing when we are doing science and chemistry in particular, when we take that um, vinegar and that bicarbonate of soda and we put them in a uh, round bottom flask and we are then, a round bottom flask is, is the, the uh, vessel that we would use to conduct that experiment. Um, what we are doing there is we are closing, we are artificially, artificially or intentionally in closing the system such that we can limit the number of uh, variables that are involved in that, in that system so that we can interrogate a particular mechanism. Now, the crucial thing there is that the scientist is actively involved as an agent in the isolation of that system. Uh, so that the, the scientist is not a passive observer, they are active in the process. So we can think about that in terms of the development of, of a scientific concept, and I'll go through this relatively quickly. Um, the important point here is, is not the discussion here, but what it leads to. So an experiment there is the intentional closure of a system. I see something that makes me curious, and so I close the system to interrogate it. And then the scientific method dictates that essentially I rinse and repeat. I repeat that experiment until it is reliably reproducible. So I, I have removed many of the variables that, that as many of the variables as I, I can think of that would confound or would change the result. I then go and publish that data. Now that there's an important step there in the publication of the data is remembering that when I publish the data, there is a community into which I publish that data. So the, the acceptance of that data into the, the literature is, is gate kept um, by 
human chemists. Um, and then what happens is that various other people around the world uh, do that experiment, repeat that experiment, um, repeat that experiment under perhaps slightly different conditions. Um, and in that process, it becomes clear what the limitations of that, that experiment are. And ultimately, the mechanism seems to hold and becomes part of the established record. Now, there's several important points here. Firstly, the reproducibility is a product of the real mechanism under interrogation, not an inherent quality of the scientist. So what, what makes science reproducible is the fact that there is this real interaction that happens between these two molecules. It isn't some magical quality that I have because I'm a chemist. The second important point is that a scientific concept requires both the reliability of the mechanism and acceptance by the community. And then thirdly, a scientific concept will build on existing knowledge. So the way in which uh, we understand molecular interaction today is significantly uh, different to the way in which um, uh, molecules were understood in, in the middle of, say, the 19th century, when it was not understood. Uh, so, say, the, the example of uh, Frederick Wuller, who, who managed to make urea, which is an organic compound, from two inorganic, inorganic salts. This was revolutionary at the time. We've uh, come a long way since then, because the idea at that stage was that organic compounds must come from an organism which is where that, uh, that um, phrase comes from. So what's crucial here is that scientists are exploring real and transitive mechanisms whose existence is independent of human action. And science is the description of those mechanisms which are empirically observable. And crucially, that that description is in fact socially constructed. It's dependent on what has gone before. So this is kind of the conception that I've come up with of the interaction between these three worlds. The physical world limited to the molecular level. Why? Because if we interrogate, say, a plant, a physicist and a chemist and a biologist will look at a plant at different levels. So we're talking about the molecular level for chemistry, the conceptual world, which is the world of chemical concepts, and the social world, which I'm calling the community of chemists. And what we have tended to do in the past is to erase this notion of the social world or to think or to simply that, that sits almost in a blind spot because we are, we are interrogating real world mechanisms. And so what I've been attempting to do is to say, no, the social world is actually important. It fundamentally uh, shapes how we view the physical world, how we view the conceptual world and particularly what becomes acceptable um, in the conceptual world. As a complete, as a, just an aside here, uh, if someone wants to ask me about this, you're welcome to, but this, this idea gives a bonus insight in that it gives us a way, a way of looking, a difference of looking as, at chemistry as science and chemistry as technology, depending on whether we take the physical world as fixed or the conceptual world as fixed. I'm just, throwing that out as a comment, I, I'm not going to talk any more about that. When we think about um, understanding, uh, drawing here on the work of Bernard Lonergan, um, when we come to, to, to understand a new chemical concept or a new, let's say a new chemical concept, um, these four steps must be involved. Experience, insight, judgment, and decision-making. And what is not, what again, we have not been very good at looking at uh, in terms of science education is recognizing that in fact, this is a profoundly communal activity. Experience, so if I think about myself going into the lab to conduct a particular experiment, I am profoundly shaped by the lab in which I was trained and the lab in which I did a postdoc. Um, that will deeply influence how I set up my experiment, um, how I understand what's happening in the flask is very much related to 
being this being 2022 with our current understanding. Um, and so whatever happens there, whatever I observe there will be profoundly influenced by everything that's gone before. Uh, when something interesting happens, and I get to a moment of insight, a moment of suggestion that maybe this might, this might be the thing, this might be the real mechanism uh, that's happening, or our understanding of the real mechanism might need a little bit of a shift. That moment of insight does, it, it does take place in my head. So that's the only, that's the only place that uh, is apparently uh, an individual step. Because the next step, of course, is judgment. Is this in fact, has, has, is my insight in fact correct? Um, and that will require going back to the literature. It'll require perhaps doing more experiments. Um, how do, what do I need to do to confirm that insight? And then finally, that'll take me to the step of decision-making, which presuming that I, that I um, judge that insight as correct, that will then result in my publishing that in some form, which again, goes back into, uh, into the community. Um, and as soon as I've published it, then somebody else will go through this cycle as they read my paper. So if we think about this, the, the consequence of this, it means that uh, just going back to the development of the scientific, uh, the development of a scientific concept, if we think about the fact that um, what is influencing the way in which we construct a concept will be profoundly influenced by where we are in time. Um, it'll be influenced by uh, the things that I use as metaphor. So uh, it'll be uh, uh, influenced by the literature I read. It'll be influenced by the, by literature, I mean sort of the popular literature, like novels and things. Um, it'll be influenced by um, the environment in which I live, um, living as I do here by the sea, uh, that, that is very different to living where I lived when I, where I grew up, which was inland in Zimbabwe. Um, it'll be influenced by the language I speak and will also be influenced surely by the cultural context. And so if everyone, because if we look at that right-hand side there where you've got these various experiments uh, going on, other people interrogating the space, then it's surely going to be better. We're surely going to zero in on a more significant, uh, 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 more reliable description of the mechanism if the people who are interrogating that have been trained in slightly different environments, have been certainly come from different cultural environments, um, which includes obviously gender and, and uh, ethnicity and all of those sorts of things. So if then in terms of, if, if we think about chemistry, the example that I usually use here is just is sort of to reduce that to different sciences. If we have somebody changed in, trained in chemistry and polymer science versus somebody trained in chemistry and mathematics versus somebody trained in chemistry and biochemistry, the questions they bring to bear on that situation will be different. And the argument that I want to make is that it's not just about their scientific training, it is profoundly about who they are in the world, will um, influence the mental models that they hold and therefore the way in which they interrogate the system. The consequence of that, of course, is that diversity is a profound asset, not a threat. This is, of course, the, the famous um, a version of the, the, the famous sort of um, Hindu, Hindu diagram of uh, how do we describe an elephant? And it, of course, depends on your perspective. Um, I don't think chemistry, when we're interrogating a particular chemistry um, issue, the, the, there are probably not so many variations, but the, the essence, I think, holds. So particularity of observation, then, is not an issue if we understand that knowledge is a collective process, not an individual event. And the, the second part of that then is that objective knowledge arises from collective, collaborative, authentic subjectivity. Um, and so therefore, the, what, the, what each individual brings is a profound gift to our 
to the development of chemistry as a science, it isn't somehow um, uh, problematic. So when we think of objectivity, when we think objectivity comes from the attempted erasure of my personal foibles, we will choose the person who most closely resembles ourselves in training and in person to perpetuate the field. And there was in fact a, an article that uh, was rapidly withdrawn um, from Angewandte Chemie, which is one of the leading uh, German chemistry journals um, in the middle of 2020, where a, a, an organic chemist uh, from Canada made an argument that um, diversity was a threat to the field. Um, so this is not <laughs> my 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 attempt to create this argument is not is is actually profoundly necessary. That paper was, as as I said, it was uh, published and then very rapidly withdrawn because of the fuel that it um, uh, that that it created. When we recognize that objective knowledge is situated in the joint effort of the community, it becomes it becomes immediately obvious that diversity is valuable. So again, here, uh, what, I've, what I've managed to do so far, I hope, is to show that in fact, these things are all linked. What's happening in the flask is linked to teaching the student about what's happening in the flask, which is inherently linked to those of us who would call ourselves the community of chemists. These things we cannot look at, uh, simply look at what's happening in the flask without taking cognizance of the fact that there is a community that influences how we look at what is, what is happening in the flask. Even though the mechanism that we are exploring uh, is a mechanism that will continue long past humans have uh, are no longer part of this universe. So the implications then in terms of uh, what this work, where, we've, where I've managed to get to in this work, is to show clearly that the, that the appropriate location of reproducibility is in the real mechanism, not in some conception of um, the objective scientist or the, the rational scientist or whatever version of, it, it's not located in the body of the scientist, it is located in the real mechanism. What this does is that it means that creativity of the individual can then come into focus. And there, my PhD project in medicinal chemistry is a good example of this. That came about precisely because I was interested in malaria, because um, my grandfather had written a, bo a book on malaria, and I had done a project in organometallic chemistry, and, but I wanted to do a medicinal chemistry project. And so the two people who became my supervisors devised a project involving metals and, and um, chloroquine derivatives such that I could do that project. Um, the third very important uh, point is that it creates an argument for diversity, which uh, serves the social justice agenda, but, but the argument is not rooted in social justice. Because if we root the argument in social justice, the, the it's far too easily dismissed as a nice to have, but actually let's not worry too much about it. The argument that I've developed here shows clearly that diversity is better for chemistry itself. And hey, look, very happily, it serves the social justice agenda too. Uh, finally, the, the final implication is that chemistry is clearly a communal activity. This isn't just uh, one person thinking up beautiful thoughts. We are very much in, invested and involved in a community and what is accepted is dictated to by that community. So it, it makes um, the, the whole notion of the fact that uh, we are profoundly influenced by and biased uh, as everyone is by the way in which we, we were trained and brought up uh, it is not something to be ignored. It is something to be acknowledged. So what's left to do? Um, again, turning to, to, to the work of Bascar, now looking at uh, some of the work that comes from um, dialectic critical realism, and particularly his, his model of the four plane of social being, 
recognizing Beskar's argument is that if we don't take into account all four of these different uh, planes, then we can try to make changes, but we we simply we're unlikely to be um, particularly um, effective. So material interactions with nature, obviously chemists would like to say, well, that's what we do all the time. But if we think about chemistry education in particular, um, questions like what are the implications of doing chemistry practicals in terms of the environmental cost, for example, when you're doing organic chemistry, there, there's organic waste that we need to deal with. What are the consequences? What's the, you know, what's the cost benefit ratio there, just in terms of a material interaction with nature? Um, honestly, for most chemists, I think we would stop the, the, the conversation there, but recognizing too that, that part of what, it, what we are doing in terms of training chemists um, is this development of social interaction and of um, helping people to become chemists. I mean, there, there's obviously a lot more to it than that, but that's just one of the elements that, that we need to consider. Social structure, of course. Um, I, I think the, the thing that, that the work clearly makes visible is the fact that social structure is in operation, even if we've been ignoring it up until now. And that social structure, particularly uh, some of the issues uh, around at the moment in terms of research funding and other things like that are playing a huge role in our understanding uh, of chemistry. But uh, my argument is that if it's playing a role in chemistry, what role does that play in chemistry education? And uh, <laughs> I think that the, the one that, that's going to take the most work and the most thinking through is this whole idea of the stratification of the embodied personality. Um, all I've really managed to do thus far is show that reflection is an important part of um, the process, an important part of the process in terms of helping the student master chemistry and um, showing the student that reflection is an important part of the process. So I think uh, certainly I, I think I'm going to be just taking this four plane of social being, um, beginning to, to pull this through in terms of chemistry education over the next uh, five or 10 years will probably be the next five or 10 years of, of, of my own work. So, so that's, that's kind of where I've got to. I know I've, I've, I've um, talked through this relatively quickly. Um, so I'm sure that there are things that I have not explained well at all, but please do uh, ask questions. I obviously have to put up a beautiful picture of our campus. That's our library underneath the, the Roy plane there. And I just want to just give thanks to uh, acknowledge in particular uh, Karen Wolf and Henley Ardendorf, who've been walking with me as I've done the second, second PhD um, and have been really very helpful in the process. And so that's it. So I will stop sharing. And uh, I think I've talked relatively quickly. So please, I'm sure that I've rushed over things. So please do ask questions if you have them. Thanks, Max. And thanks for <clears throat> opening up such a rich terrain uh, for us. And a couple of questions are coming through in the chat. I might ask you one first, I think. Um, I'm, um, I'm intrigued by the, you know, your, your characterization, the social character of chemistry and, um, you know, it's, it's social location, the positioning, the importance of, uh, of social relations as part of the problem, part of the, the discussion of how knowledge is formed. Um, it, it seemed to, you, at one point you said, what's accepted is, is, is partly determined by the community, by the social mm -hmm. relations around the person mm -hmm. who's the scientist. And, and I thought that was interesting. And that's what I wanted to pick up. Um, I mean, there's clearly um, in all fields, knowledge has to go through a process going beyond a small group or a single person to the point where it's publishable mm -hmm. and published. It has to reach a larger community that way. Right. So there's a considerable uh, institutional and um, personal scope for gatekeeping mm -hmm. at that point. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and clearly in relation to power coming to play there and so on. Um, there's a, a, you know, the question of what's persuasive as opposed to what's real 
seem to me different questions in some respects, or at least there are two aspects to what's real, isn't there? There's what's real and what seems plausible as well. Absolutely. Um, I remember I remember seeing a, a, a the economics is a much more normative discipline, so it's not a perfect fit, an, an, um, analogy, but I remember seeing a very good piece by an economist, rather wry piece, saying that actually um, I've studied uh, you know, a bunch of the leading journal articles in the field. And when I drill down, what I see there is what makes them persuasive is all kinds of normative signals and, uh, you know, common associations that they call up and, um, you know, commitments and values and, you know, mm -hmm. are in play and so on. So, I mean, as I said, economics is more normative. Um, but, you know, what's persuasive may not be just what's real. Uh, mm -hmm. Clearly there's scope here in this whole apparatus of social relations around the knowledge producer there's scope to eliminate a lot of important discoveries that never reach discussion. That's absolutely true, Simon. And I think um, there's a, I forget who it is now, uh, who says, you know, scientific discovery uh, uh, progresses one funeral at a time. <laughs> um, so, so as a big name in the field passes on, the field can open in smaller fields it, it can open up so i yeah. think that that's that's absolutely true and i think it's important um I, i'm not sure how many how many people will be aware of this but the practice in chemistry education is that the the review is blind but they will have access to so you your name will be visible to the re re reviewer so you know, if, if somebody is publishing, if, you know, one of my colleagues who's an A-rated chemist uh, is, is publishing a paper, um, it's going to be taken more seriously because his name is on the paper yeah. and the data may be identical. Um, and and there have been many publications in terms of uh, gender bias, you know, if we use an initial as opposed to a, a first name. So there are all sorts of issues there. And you know the university that the person has come from, and so on, can absolutely ha have an impact. Yeah. Um, now I think we'll begin the discussion proper, and let's bring in Glenn Chatelier for the first question. Glenn, are you there? Hello, Glenn. Glenn, you might be muted. We're not getting any sound from you. Moment. That's okay, can hard. you can you see me and hear me now? Yes, uh, thanks. See you. Yeah, and hear you. Thanks so much for that very engaging discussion. Uh, my my question may be simplistic, but I think it's something that uh, you know really goes into the considerations that you stated in your process of the theory that you construct. And I'm asking uh, what. for judgment in judgment interchangeably as you construct your theory towards you know the testing and education through chemistry okay did so you get a question I, there? yeah i lost you a little bit there glenn but i'm going to read your question in the chat um because i because i think it's yeah. it's an elaboration on that question so the question in the chat is what in your theory controls error and judgment in the scientific endeavor? And I think there, um, essentially, if we're thinking about that in terms of um, developing scientific knowledge, that would be peer review, um, uh, partly peer review, partly, um, I mean, I would, I would imagine that in an ideal world, every scientist would uh, double check their own results, right? So you would go back into the lab and check that this actually holds and test on a bunch of similar systems. So your initial check and judgment would be your own work. Uh, then the second step would be to go into peer review. And if that, it, but that's still not foolproof. We know that things get published that are then overturned. So then the, the next step is then interrogation by other, chem, other chemists in the field who then go, actually, this, this isn't holding. And then discussion would, would, would come over that. So I think that the error, the error is elimit, eliminated over time as more people try to reproduce the reproduce the results. 
Hey, a follow up. Um, C. Sanger, would you like to come in, please? Yes, yes. Hello there. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, I was interested in your diagram of the practice of chemistry, uh, the one that links the physical molecular world, the conceptual world and the, the social world. Um, mm -hmm. And I wondered if, if and to what extent it might perhaps be, just be transferable to other fields. That's a great question. And I think it really is transferable to other fields. Um, the, the, the only part of that diagram that needs changing is what constitutes the physical world. So for other sciences, it would definitely apply for other sciences, but I think it, um, or natural sciences, I should say, um, I think it can also apply to other fields though, um, where the, the, the point of interrogation say it, it could apply to education where what would be replaced by the, the physical world would be the educational world. Um, so it's, it's the location, it's, it's the place of operation of the real mechanism that's under interrogation. Thanks. Uh, Sharon, Sharon Ulch, could you like to come in please? Yes, hi, thank you. And thanks for your talk. Um, as I was listening to you, one of the things, one of my interests is, where does these, these ideas intersect with the classroom and what scientists actually do in practice when they're, um, because that's where the replication of some of these ideas come from. So uh, I'm just curious, Meg, about your talk seems to put, point to the importance, as I say in the chat, of science educators actually understanding learning theory and, and constructivism. And, and where does that get built into the academy that that also becomes part of our training as scientists and then finally, I'm also wondering about what's your um, your talk in relationship to discipline-based educational research. So just if you can make a comment, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. I think um, I think this this is essential in terms of the, the the training of science educators because the thing that we we don't do well is make the link between it's almost like science and science education are two separate fields. And I'm hoping what I'm able to do here is to show that is to provide a, a way of thinking about the science such that it influences the education. So I think that that's essential. Um, it's interesting where that connects with disciplinary based educational research. Um, I am, my colleagues continually complain that I'm too theoretical. Um, or too philosophical, they use both of those words, uh, because it's, it's diving deep into how we think about this. Um, and so I'm going to have to work quite hard in the next little while to show that this actually does have a practical implication for how we teach. So that, that's my next project. So if you're, if you're interested in engaging with me on that, I'd be delighted. Um. I'm going to change the order a little. Uh, the, Marta, can you hold um, for a second? I'd like to bring in Sayong Lee at this point because it follows some of the previous points. Sayong. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, Max, for your presentation. So I'm curious about your thoughts and the relationship between this knowledge and scientists. So you mentioned that scientists as agents are influenced by this. No, they influence the physical and conceptual world. Then what about the other way around? Is scientist agency static or is it dynamic so that it can be improved by scientists' relationship and engagement with this knowledge? I mean, conceptual and physical right. world. Such a great question. I think it's dynamic. I think yeah. it's dynamic. Um, and what I'm hoping that this work will do is to bring is, is to make that make that visible such that it can be actively engaged with to see what difference that makes. So fantastic question. And again, I, I, if you've got more thoughts on that, I would be delighted to engage. Yes, that question was great, wasn't it? And it certainly got me going. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of things now. Um, a, lot, a lot of us working on epistemic diversity, uh, mm -hmm. not just diversity of, 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 of epistemic communities, but, but, but epistemic diversity itself. And, and the question of you know what's authoritative knowledge and whether and how we might supplement that with much more diverse knowledges and so on. Um, but the sort of nub of the matter is is the sciences, isn't it? I mean, it's easy yeah. to say we can have lots of different philosophical or social science positions on things, 
Um, but you know, is there is there another chemistry out there that we're not taking into account? Uh, I, I um, worked on a project on STEM in higher education and schooling a few years ago, which compared different country approaches, and we had a, a really good chapter on an indigenous mathematics from Canada, which argued very effectively that there's a different kind of mathematics here and this is useful and relevant and so on well that was quite uncompromising you know mathematics of all things the one that we, we sort of hold to as universal or, or practice as universal is there another chemistry that you've come across that you thought was persuasive yeah. so the the interesting thing about chemistry is that chemistry has been around in terms of using it as a technology since we learned to brew or learn to cook things. I mean, all of those metallurgy, all, all of that stuff is chemistry. So there's a, there are many, many, many different kinds of using of use of chemistry as technology, but chemistry as a science only really came about and in uh, the 1800s with the development of precision balances where we could, it was then that we could then link the understanding to a, 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 an atomic understanding. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that chemistry may be unique in this respect in that it is so linked to the development of uh, precision instruments, which right. is very much a Western, a Western thing. Um, so I, I think it's a little different. You can imagine a different biology, for example, but, but a different chemistry, uh, not to my knowledge, uh, but I think that there is a lot to learn. There may be a lot of different technologies out there that could then be interrogated and improved upon uh, through engagement with chemistry. Um, but I could be wrong. I, I, I stand to be corrected, but that, that is my current understanding. That makes sense to me that it's instrument derived, but um, that would suggest that with different techniques, other things could happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And maybe that's what astrophysics is all about, you know, with different modes of measurement and so on, mm -hmm. creating different possibilities. Um, a second question for me, um, I, I'd like you to expand a bit on the stratification of the embodied personality. I mean, it struck me that that was really important and, uh, and, uh, and perhaps we'd, we'd benefit from hearing more of your cool. thinking about that. So because that was a fairly quick presentation of the con of what seems to be a key concept. Yeah, so the stratification of the embodied personality there um, really, I mean, that goes through all of the, the elements that we would understand from in, in some of the elements that we would understand from psychology, so things like the ego and sort of that the different elements of, of the human person. Um, the, the, the reason that I sort of, swept over it is because it also points very much into Bascar's idea of materiality and this the sense of um, the the person the person that is uh, the potential of the ideal person that is somehow um, beyond the physical reality which uh, if I pr present that to any of my of my scientist friends they'll <laughs> they'll, they'll shut me down on that one um, but I think that there is so much more to when we walk into the chemistry laboratory, we, are, we, we come as the, the, the whole person. So we come with our psychological matur maturity, we come with the ego development, we come with our imagination, we come with all of these different elements. And so uh, I, I think more broadly educationally, if we can think about how we engage with the, the whole human person, um, it, it does change as opposed to being a sort of a, a vehicle for knowledge transfer. <laughs> if, mm. if, we, if we really engage with the whole human person, there's a, there's, it could actually fairly radically change how we think about education. And I think in addition to that, um, we are so profoundly influenced by the, the sort of the, the idea of the individual as the locus of knowledge. Mm. And I think, again, we hold knowledge, uh, we hold knowledge collectively, 
we work best with knowledge when we're actually interacting with one another there's again a, a huge amount that of rethinking that could be done in that space so i'm i'm myself i'm still scratching the surface on that um i'll come back in a couple of years and tell you about the <laughs> the development of thought in that space the, the the role of the single person and the role of the conversation uh, seems to vary from discipline to discipline yeah. uh and i mean how how I mean, some disciplines seem to be so large group based, you know, and, 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 and you know, work in these really big teams and, and others, you know, individual scholars uh, popping in play or, or collaborators, you know, two people, yeah. two or three people play a really central role. What's it, how, how team based is chemistry? So chemistry and certainly my own field of chemistry is very much team based, um, but it's, it's team based almost. Uh, it's interesting working working between chemistry and education, I find fascinating because chemistry is very much more team based in the laboratory right, right. they're different people doing things, you may be working on parallel projects or related projects. Um, but you could, in one sense, the thinking almost seems to be you could take a person out and then search a second person and they could do the same job. Um, my work in education is actually much more collaborative, intellectually collaborative. Yeah. Uh, although most of the time I'm sitting on my own doing my thing. So it's a very, it's it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting dynamic there. And I think still our understanding, our understanding of ourselves as chemists as is as me as the chemist, um, who might happen to be working with other people. But, uh, but there's, there's not quite such a recognition of the commonly held, the knowledge that is generated through interaction. My sense of education is a lot of things emerge through practical activity. You know, a lot of new ideas come there mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and get, get sort of half floated or sort of half formed and then discussed and then built on. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of this sort of common sort of shared formation that goes on uh, in, in, and it's partly because education has got such a practical agenda anyway. I mean, the study of education is largely about educational improvement, about improving learning really for large numbers of people. And, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, everyone's got this common practical task uh, at the back of their minds. Um, and, uh, and, 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 uh, the more purely conceptual or theoretical edge of things may be more like a conventional humanity or social science, for example. Yeah. I'd like to bring in Lauren Boltz, who's there, I see in the in on screen. Lauren, hello. Hello. Um, thank you for such an interesting talk. I used to be a chemist and I've since moved into education. So a lot of this is I found this really interesting. Um, my so my question is about what implications do you think this kind of conversation could have about. I said higher education policy and interdisciplinary conversations. So I've been talking a lot with people about, um, you know, trying to get, you know, say chemists and social science and humanity, um, humanity students working together. And a lot of times barriers will come up in that um, because social science and humanities are seen as so much more subjective. Um, sometimes those collaborations don't happen as, as well as they could. So I'm just kind of wondering about what you think this kind of conversation could do to that. Yeah, I think it really could help. Uh, I think it probably needs a further piece of information, and that would be uh, work that I have done, but is not included in this talk. Is kind of explaining social science to the chemists and how that how that works. Um, and I think they're making, you know, using that uh, the picture of the practice of chemistry and switching that to the practice of social science, and how actually it's a very similar thing. You're just looking at a a real mechanism in the social world, as opposed to a real mechanism in the um, in in the physical world. But you, I think, you're probably limited to uh, social scientists who are realists. Um, I think one has to be a little bit pragmatic about who you include in the conversation. I think if you're working with critical realism. There's a lot of people doing that right now. Yeah. Um, and this is, you know, this conversation, I mean, you know, the focus on ontology mm -hmm. uh, and the way that's opened up things for people has been 
very widely, I think, felt. Uh, I, I have a sense that uh, we're all sort of converging again. Like, you know, in these mm -hmm. conversations, you get these periods where people converge around some key ideas and then and then then you get their fragmentation and diversion and you know both both moments are quite important you know i think and um and at the moment anyway i think those core ideas basker and margaret archer and others you know uh andrew say particularly mm -hmm. i think in social science have been uh you know influencing a lot of people and uh, making it possible to carry forward certain progressive agendas but in a more i suppose rigorous way than before yeah. too and to allow us to maintain a sort of realism and a normative, normative commitments at the same time. So this has been quite a powerful combination. Um, we're moving to the end, uh, I think. Uh, let me ask you again, if I can, what do you want to do in the next two or three years with this material? I mean, where are you taking your own work now? Uh, so so I, th I think for me, it's taking it back into, is really going through the threads of the implications for chemistry education. I think right. they're, they're implicitly there, but I think to, to make it, for the rubber to hit the road, I need to make that explicit. I see that uh, Diddy Griffin has popped into the chat. Do you want to say something, Diddy? Hello? Yes, did you want do, do you want to go on screen and, and say what you just said in the chat? I'm trying to. Um, you, you're here. At least you can hear me. I don't know if you can see me. Yeah. No, both. Yeah, we can. Uh, okay. Um, I, I was just saying uh, as a suggestion that if you want to have discussions or start offs with cross disciplinary uh, work, that the model of Angela Brew uh, she developed or at least she published it at the early uh, at the start of the century. Um, can be very helpful. I've, I've had many workshop kind of sessions where starting researchers uh, were, were interested in each other's work as well as surprised about what the others think uh, is real in research and what, what, what are the values and, and, and the beliefs underpinning uh, notions of truth, etc. cetera. Um, and I wondered if um, some of you knew that because it, it can be very helpful, that's all. Thank you. you know, I was familiar with Angela's work. Um, the, uh, uh, I think it's been a really good conversation and it just shows the value of talking about science and in this way. And um, Mags, I mean, if you want to come back on and take, you know, when you've got further work to present to us, we, we really welcome you back. Um, you know, I think you've opened up a lot, a lot of things today and I suspect this YouTube video is going to be widely used. Uh, we're finding now that our webinar material is being used more through the YouTube viewing platform than than it is on the day um but um but thank you again and let me uh encourage everyone to tune in again next tuesday when we're going to be we're going to be returning to africa in a way um we're going to be talking about uh china's role in doctoral training in africa uh presentation will be from david mills and natasha robinson uh and and they've been looking at um evidence, empirical work on, on uh, the expanding role of China in supporting African students at the doctoral education stage and how that might be changing patterns of, of international patterns of doctoral educational mobility, but also uh, creates a sort of alternative or different path uh, to the, the Western experience for African students. And of course, there's all the questions that that invokes around China's role in Africa and how we understand that. You know, is this, a, is this a, the, a, another version of the old scramble for Africa, the imperialist um, innovation in Africa? Is this a different, is it, is it a, a, a lopsided relationship but of a different kind? Is it a relationship of equals? You know, to what extent is agency being built in Africa? What kind of agency is being built? What's the long-term implications? Um, so that's next Tuesday, Africa, China and China, Africa from knowledge diplomacy to research training. Um, we look forward to seeing you then. And meanwhile, we'll say once again, thanks, Max, and uh, bye uh, for now to everyone.